Ukraine says it's broken through enemy lines at several points near the southern city of Kherson. It's mounting a campaign to retake territory occupied by Russia. The push comes after weeks of preparation. Ukraine has been attacking Russia's supply routes in an attempt to isolate troops in the area. Russia captured Kherson early on in the war. Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky is vowing to push Russian forces out of all occupied territories, saying there'll be no place for the invaders on Ukrainian land. Ukraine is returning its own. And it will return Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, Saporizhia, the Kherson regions, Crimea and definitely the waters of the Black and Azov Seas. Ben Hodges is a military expert and former commander of U.S. forces in Europe. Welcome. Ukraine's long been expected to launch a, a major counteroffensive. Is this the beginning of it? Well, we're, we're not sure. Uh, the Ukrainian general staff has done a very good job of protecting information. Uh, we know more about the Russians than we do about what Ukrainian forces are doing. But certainly, the last few weeks, we have seen uh, effective use of HIMARS and other weapon systems to, to do what we call shaping operations, to attrit or degrade Russian logistics, uh, artillery and rockets, command and control. It does has the feeling, it does have the feeling of the beginning of something large, uh, but we're not sure yet. There's a lot more to unfold in the next few days. But would you say that the Ukrainian military has the capacity to, to launch a, a successful counteroffensive? Yeah, I do. Um, the, again, the Ukrainian general staff has done a good job of preparation. Um, they have resisted the urge to push every new tank and uh, every new soldier into the current fight, holding on to them to build up a force that would be ready uh, to launch an attack once the conditions are set on the ground. So what we're seeing, for example, the isolation of thousands of Russian troops on the northwest side of the Dnipro River, for example, uh, the, the significant reduction of artillery from the Russian side, all of these things are necessary preparations. I think that Ukraine if, in fact, they do launch their uh, offensive, uh, they will have picked the right time and place to do it. And you say we know more about the Russians. How do you expect them to respond? Well, of course, we're seeing a variety of, of uh, reactions from nothing's happening, nothing to see over here, to people panicking, both in terms of soldiers, but also even uh, civilians on the uh, Russian side of the border in Belgorod. Um, and I think there's great concern. The problem is, uh, the Russians have not yet fixed the many problems that they had that, that, that were on display back in February and March, especially their command and control framework for how they make decisions, uh, move people around. That's it's still a mess, to be candid. And their logistical system is fragile. It's exhausted. It has gotten weaker by the, uh, with every passing week. So they're not as able to react to changes in the situation as they, as we might have expected earlier. What about Putin last week announcing a 10% increase in Russian troops in Ukraine? What's that say about the state of the Russian army? Well, it, it's very interesting. First, that um, that they would say that is, is a public acknowledgement that there's a problem, number one. Uh, number two, the um, I would say that this is a number that they will never get. There are, you know, I would bet, a large amount of money. There's not 137,000 Russians wanting to step forward and join the military. And in fact, there's a tradition in Russia of uh, serious inflation of numbers. They've never had what they said they had, but this is a classic means of corruption to claim you have a certain number to draw salaries when in fact you're only paying about a half to, to three quarters of that. So uh, there is a real manpower problem uh, in Russia, which is not something that I would have thought I'd said a, a few months ago. Uh, they just don't have people that want to get in this fight. And frankly, it's a overall a uh, unhealthy population decreasing in size. I, I don't think they'll ever get to 137,000. And if they did, it would be months before these guys would show up with any level of training and, and proper equipment. Well, let's see if this proves to be a turning point. Ben Hodges, military expert and former commander, thank you. Thanks for the privilege. DW's Matthias Perlinger is in southern Ukraine. Matthias, what are you hearing about Ukraine's offensive? Yeah, it seems that there are three points where the Ukrainian army 
uh, has been either heavily put pressure on the Russians or even take back some territory. Uh, that's uh, west of Kherson, uh, um, the, the land bridge that connects it to Mykolaiv, and uh, that's uh, near the Ingulets River. That's the that's where Ukraine has been able to establish a bridgehead. They've been able to cross uh, this river for some time, but they have been basically stuck on that, uh, on that piece of land that they were able uh, to set over to, and they seem to have expanded this area. And the third one is further north. That's where the Novakakhovka Dam is, in the direction of the Novakakhovka Dam. They're not in Novakakhovka yet. Uh, that's a dam that uh, is one potential crossing of the river also. The crossing itself has been destroyed by Ukrainian rockets. As far as we understand, it's not possible to pass there now, but still it remains an important strategic point. All these points are still at a distance from Kherson city center. It's not that they are really uh, uh, approaching Kherson city center, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good step ahead there. How are the Russians responding? We've seen shelling of Mykolaiv, for example. Mykolaiv is not far from these places. It's a city that has been uh, hit by rockets constantly throughout the past few weeks, and that's the same last night. There's also rockets have also come down near here, where I am in Zaporizhia and other places. So the uh, reply by Russia is the one that's, uh, that's usually happening. It's uh, rockets on cities. You're not too far from the embattled nuclear power plant at Zaporizhia. Is shelling and fighting still going on there? Yeah, that's what we're hearing. Shelling has been happening constantly throughout the past few weeks, I must say. Um, and uh, it seems, according to the Russian occupational authorities, that this night again some shells have landed in the town nearby where the uh, the, the, the uh, power plants, um, engineers, etc., live, um, and uh, not on the site of the plant itself, but in the past few days we've also seen something hitting there. So, um, yes, uh, this, uh, uh, this area is, uh, is, is embattled and uh, the dangers are still there. And international inspectors are set to arrive at the plant tomorrow. W will they get full and safe access to the site? Nobody knows that. I mean, there is an agreement, basically, that they can travel there. Russia has said it will give them access, but what will be on site, nobody knows. What precautions are being taken against a potential radiation leak? There are many uh, security systems in a nuclear power plant. The uh, uh, reactors themselves are pretty sturdy. As far as we've been hearing, a shell wouldn't be able to break that and, and open up the reactor and release the energy. But the weakest spot are the cooling systems. Even if the reactors are shot off, uh, they need to be cooled for several months until uh, the, the fuel has really cooled down enough so it's safe to leave it uh, without cooling. And um, these systems, they're dependent on electricity and the most uh, dangerous thing is plus possibly an electricity cut. We've been pretty close to that a few days ago when the, when the uh, plant was taken off the grid. There are generators that are then supplying uh, the energy, but that seems to be the most critical point. To what extent Russia has taken precautions on site enough fuel, etc. we don't know. That's something the IAEA will have to figure out when they're on site. Matthias Bollinger, in Zaporizhia for us. Thank you very much for your reporting. Defence ministers from across the European Union are meeting in Prague to discuss the bloc's military support for Ukraine. The talks are expected to focus on setting up EU training for the Ukrainian army to operate Western weapons. Here's a look at some of the military aid that Ukraine is receiving. Ukraine's ammunition supply is about to get a boost. Its howitzer artillery units will be stocked with a new type of shell called the Volcano. Germany says it's sending several hundred Volcano munitions to the front line. The GPS and laser-guided missiles reach up to 80 kilometers, almost doubling the range of most howitzers. Already existing donated equipment is having an impact. There were shellings on Slovyansk every day. 
But due to new weapons that were received from the West, particularly HIMARS and howitzers, our chances have equalized. Before, one of our shots was answered with 50 shots from them. Today the ratio is 1 to 4, or 1 to 5. HIMARS are the US-supplied long-range mobile rocket launchers, which have allowed Ukraine to hit deep behind Russian lines. Countries have pledged almost 90 billion euros worth of equipment or military financing. The US is by far the biggest donor, followed by the United Kingdom and the European Union. Poland is number four. Its donations include howitzer artillery vehicles like these to replace Ukraine's Soviet-era tanks and cannon. I think the advance is more successful on our side because our equipment is more modern. We attack the occupiers more precisely. Germany is the fifth biggest military donor. It has now pledged almost 2 billion euros worth of aid, including anti-aircraft vehicles and training for troops to operate them. The men who are here will defend their country. They will defend it against the terrible threat posed to Ukraine by Russia's brutal war of aggression. And we will continue to support them with our financial capabilities, but also with weapons. And private individuals have also sent millions to help Ukraine buy drones for its fleet of eyes in the sky. Foreign support has been crucial in keeping Ukraine's resistance efforts afloat and helping it defend its territory for longer than anyone expected. Here's DW's Alexander van Namen in Prague with more on what EU defence ministers will discuss today. There are two main issues on their agenda. Arms deliveries, uh, for instance, uh, we just saw that EU member states are providing Ukraine with all kinds of military equipment, but those deliveries are depleting their stocks. So uh, the question here is, and def uh, defence ministers are going to discuss that, how they can push the industry to produce more. Some of them are suggesting that they need more European funding. Some of them are in favour of joint procurement of uh, weapon systems or ammunition. And another topic that is here on the agenda is a high-level training mission for the Ukrainian army. EU foreign policy chief Josep Borrell told us that he is expecting the uh, defence ministers to give their uh, political backing for such a training mission. We know that some member states, France or Germany or Denmark, there are already training Ukrainian soldiers, but the goal here is for the European Union to coordinate such a mission and to finance it. And EU foreign ministers are also meeting to discuss visa restrictions for Russian travellers. Yes, uh, visa restrictions for Russian citizens are looming large over the meeting of the foreign ministers later today here in Prague with many member states demanding a total ban on uh, Russian uh, visas, of, of, uh, on tourist uh, visas. However, uh, some member states, among them France and Germany, oppose uh, such a ban. Germany and France circulated a paper ahead of the meeting here saying that it's important to respect the people-to-people -people exchange, that it's important that Russian artists, uh, opposition figures or intellectuals, students are still able to come to the European Union. So as you can see, there is little appetite for the moment for such a total ban. But I think with many Eastern European and Baltic states demanding such a step, this discussion is here to stay. Alexandra Vernamen for us in Prague. Thank you very much.